So the Dine people who live around here, they call themselves the Nesselin, the Nesselin, which means something like the only real and true people. Um, in Oglala, it's a Che Chasha. It's, it's, um, it's not Su. It's, the word is a Che Chasha. Su means dirty rotten snake in Blackfoot or something like that. So, <coughs> so anyway, um, one of the elders said that, that really we, we should show them these because the, the spirit behind, the spirit that moves this kind of activity is still alive on the earth. It's still here. You know, the spirit is still running around. You know, it pops up in Iraq, Afghanistan, U.S. You know, it, the spirit that moves this kind of genocide is still um, very much alive. And he said, that's really, you know, if we're going to be cross-cultural, that's really one of the things we have to address is this notion of, of kill everyone who's not like us, you know, because they're not really people. And um, so this is Charles Eastman, and just briefly, he, was, he lived a traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle until he was 15. And then um, he went to Dartmouth College, Boston University School of Medicine, and interned at Boston City Hospital, and was the physician for Wounded Knee from about um, 1885, I think, until 1935. And, and a lot of people don't know this, he helped found the Boy Scouts with that fellow Beard. And he was the guy that invented the Order of the Arrow and the whole Weeblo thing based upon his culture. And he wrote 19 books, which are mostly, most of which are still in print, which I recommend to you. And um, so he's, he's Oglala from my father's town. And um, finally, I just wanted to show you where I work, and then we'll get into the meat of the presentation. This is how we get to the reserves that we go to. Reserve is Canadian for reservation. So, and I'll probably use the word Aboriginal from time to time instead of Native American because in Canada there are no Native Americans, there are only Aboriginal people and First Nations people. So, um, this is the river by where I live. This is the South Saskatchewan River. This is the bridge near where I live. This is what the land looks like around where I live. It's kind of pretty, isn't it? Can you imagine it covered by, covered with bison? Imagine that, uh, the bison herds used to be so big that it would take three days for them to walk by. So, <clears throat> and this was the U.S. position on, you know, the U.S. had Indian wars and the Canadian position was, that's too expensive, let's just kill all the food. So that's, that was what was behind killing all the buffalo, was to force, you know, the Aboriginal people to take treaty and to settle on reserves. This is uh, autumn. And actually, there's a joke about Saskatchewan. There's two seasons, winter and July. <laughs> and it's almost over. <laughs> actually, the leaves are starting to turn, if you can believe that. Um, here's another classic skyline by where I live. And this is what Saskatchewan looks like, in case anyone wondered. Most times when I talk in the States, nobody's ever Nobody has a clue where Saskatchewan is. Most people think it's a, a city in Quebec. <laughs> so, um, so this is um, the, the, the state underneath us is Montana. Some of you have heard of Montana. Um, and uh, this, is, this is where, this is the far north on that slide. I work at the very top of Saskatchewan, where it borders the Northwest Territories. And um, this is, I told, these are the trees, they're kind of small. This is Lake Athabasca, the sand dunes, the kids, some of the kids I work with. And this is how people still get around in the winter, which is kind of cool to see them going like this next to the airport. This is lunch <laughs> in northern Saskatchewan. <laughs> Hello, lunch! <laughs> this, is, this is how the elders, many of the elders still live this way. This is a pretty... Well, it's not atypical. And uh, this is another town that I work in, Uranium City. Can you guess what they do there? <laughs> I think you can. Here's a, a typical res house, another typical res house. And this is for later. I'm going to show you some sweat lodge pictures later. So I'm going to turn off the show now. And um, 
talk, talk to you. And then at the end, we'll, we'll um, bring up some more images to close with. And I just need um, the timekeeper and whoever the timekeeper is to give me a 10 minute warning. Is, is um, okay, great. <coughs> so, so really I wanna, I wanna take some time today to, to introduce you to the Aboriginal worldview. What do, what do Aboriginal and Indigenous people think about mind and mental health, about emotional distress? How is it different from the Eurocentric worldview? Everyone who has been to university has been indoctrinated into a Eurocentric worldview. It's not the only way to look at the world. I know that's a shock to a lot of people, but um, it turns out there's a lot of other ways to look at the world, and most of those other people are a little bit angry that their way of seeing the world is being marginalized as, as globalization proceeds. So um, I personally think diversity is really important, and biodiversity is important if you saw Andromeda strain in the movie, you know that it was one little species of bacteria that saved the earth, you know, from the invading microorganisms. So you never know when you're gonna meet a little bug, you know, or, or some other kind of critter. You, know? you never know when, when these critters can come in handy. So let's not kill them all off. Let's not eliminate all species on the planet. And, and, and let's not eliminate all worldviews, but the Eurocentric also. So, um, what I'm, this is a little bit of a perceptual archaeology because today your average, your typical, your ordinary aboriginal person is a, is a hybrid of these because you can't not get acculturated living in America. It reminds me, of, there's a story by Thomas King in a lovely book called A Short History of Indians in Canada, which is a book of short stories about a 10th grader named Milton Friendly Bear. And Milton is assigned to do an essay for 10th grade on, on the Indian Act, which is the Canadian version of uh, US law that put Indians on reservations. And he comes home to go into the backyard, to go into the teepee to sit with his grandfather so they can watch Star Trek on the widescreen TV. <laughs> so so you, can't, you can't live you can't live in 2008 without getting acculturated. And, and cultural diffusion exists. It's always existed. People share things with other cultures. One of the, one of the most exciting things that happened on the prairies in the 1800s was, was um, the iron pot. Can you imagine being an aboriginal woman and, and discovering the iron pot? That was hot. Everybody wanted one. You know, that was a hot trade item in the prairies. So that's cultural diffusion. You know, people trade with other people and, and you know, culture changes or, or expands, you might say. You know, uh, my favorite definition of culture is all of the stories that are told in a locality and all of the productions that people have created from telling those stories to each other. So if you think about that idea of culture, the culture in Santa Fe is, is a whole rich hybrid of, of stories and productions like buildings and different architectural styles. And you got Walmart at the edge of town and you got La Fonda in the center of town. Now that's a big cultural difference. So, um, and you can see why we're meeting here and not at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> 